Okay, let's go into the main topic for today, which is um, the basics of propulsion systems. It's only sometimes maybe something as 15 slides, so it's quite short, but it's just in order to have the basics. Um, so the idea is to go into this kind of system and to understand why we need to have some propulsion systems. So the very basics. Propulsion means to propel, to push away, to change the, the motion. Okay, So you have any kind of vehicle, whether it is into space or into the atmosphere, and you want to change its motion for any kind of purpose. And so for that, you need a propulsion system, and there's a lot of different propulsion systems, but the most common one, and probably the only one we will be interested into, or maybe except in your propulsion project, because if you want to go outside of this field, why not? Uh, the one we will be interested into during this uh, semester is jet propulsion system. So the jet propulsion system is when you have... I just check because I'm... Okay, so it works. It's when you have this kind of thing and you are just storing some gas and you are rejecting the gas. So sometimes it's usual gas, sometimes it's more about plasma, but for example, some space probe, which are using this kind of engine. And because you are losing some momentum, okay, if you are losing some momentum and you know that the complete momentum of the system must be conserved, it means you will gain some momentum on this. And so you will produce a force here that will be compensated by this. So it's only about some compensation of the force. Any kind of force might be compensated by another one. It's a Newton's third law. And so if you are rejecting some gas at a specific speed outside of your engine, you will create a force, okay, which is called thrust. Thrust is the name of the force which is used in order to propel any kind of vehicle. And it's only about the Newton's laws of mechanics. It's absolutely un unrelated to the surrounding you have all around your vehicle. So it works exactly the same whether you are into atmosphere or in space. Okay? You don't have to push on something in order to propel. It's just about I'm losing some momentum and to compensate it, I would just accelerate and change my motion. Okay? So please, if you just think about some atmosphere which is needed, it's wrong. It's only about the laws of mechanics. That's it. Okay? And so it works exactly the same on the main force we will calculate in the rest of this lecture on tutorial on projects are related to thrust. It's called thrust. It's a force which is used to propel the vehicles. So, okay. So for what? Uh, two different things. We can, for example, change the motion because we want to accelerate we want to increase our speed, or we want also to decrease the speed. So to increase, we can use any kind of usual engine, but it's also possible to use it in order to decrease the speed, for example, during the landing of an aircraft. And for so, we can use, for example, a thrust inverter. Okay? So thrust inverter is this kind of device which is used in order to push, to reject some gas, but in the opposite direction of the motion in order to just decelerate, and to help to decelerate. Okay? It's not the only one, the, the, the sole system which is used to decelerate an aircraft, hopefully, because if not, you would have a lot of trouble. There is also some brakes which, which are on the wheels, but this one can be also useful for some. So this one is for aircraft, but in spacecraft, it's also possible to just change your position or your motion. So this is an example. In this case, it's a space shuttle, but it works exactly the same for satellite or any kind of space probe. You are in a complete vacuum, so there is no drag, there is no effect of any kind of air or gas outside. It's on usually only about gravity. And so in this case, propulsion systems are just used by some impulsion, by some push. Okay? And so you turn your system on for a few seconds, you just change your orientation, and so you stop. Okay? And it's why you have this kind of propelling system, which are really small, and it's just used in order to change your orientation, because it's the only way to do so in vacuum. Okay? You cannot use any kind of lever outside. There is nothing. It's just the complete vacuum. And so, from a mathematical point of view, you will have to produce some force in order to change your motion in any kind of motion. And the change of motion, which is related to uh, this, is 
called total impulse. So there is a little typo here because it's a vectorial quantity. And so, the total impulse is IT when you have the integral of the force over time. For example, for one position, for one time, one on time two, for example, the, it corresponds to this, the, the sequence you are accelerating or you are just turning on your engine. And this one corresponds, it's, quite, it's not complicated to demonstrate it, to just the difference of momentum, okay? P with a vector is just the momentum, so one of the quantities which is conserved in the laws of mechanics, okay? And so you have some momentum at the beginning, you just turn on or turn off your engine, or maybe turn on, but just to decelerate, and so you change your motion, and at the end you will obtain another momentum, okay? So um, an amount of motion. In French it's quite easier because it's quantitative movement, but in English it's momentum, okay? It's the amount of motion which is contained in any kind of motion, okay? And so this is basically the kind of use we can do with these uh, devices. this. So why? What is the purpose of a uh, propulsion system? For aircraft, it's really simple. It's because we need to transport some mass from one point to another point. And for so, we need to create the lift. Okay? The lift is the force that we push up your vehicle. Okay? So the lift, when you're, uh, I will try to draw some vehicles. I'm a really bad drawer, so you have the right to just laugh at me for one to two minutes, not more. After that, it's quite, you know, not really good. So, yes, this is an aircraft, a quite old, but I'm an old guy, so it's... Okay, and you want to fly it. And if you don't want to crash, you will need to create some force in order to maintain the vehicle into the air, and this force is called lift. Okay, you are here. Good road, right? Maybe it's another job I can try to... No. So, the lift is here, because you want to maintain this into the air, and in order to create this, to create the lift, in order to compensate the weight, because weight is obviously in the other direction, Okay, wait, it's here, okay? Uh, if you want to create the lift, you will need to move, and if you move, to, you will create a drag. So the drag is the resistance force, which is just created by the motion of the vehicle, okay? And so, drag is in this direction, so imagine you have your center of mass, which is here, so this one is drag. And in order to compensate this drag, oh, yeah, four color, it's really perfect you will need to produce thrust. Okay? So, the causality, the chain of causality of this problem is I want to compensate a weight, so I need to create a lift. But if I create a lift, I also create a drag, and in order to compensate the drag, I will need to produce a thrust. Okay? All of this, this picture on this situation corresponds to a stationary flight. Obviously, if, you are, it's, if it's during the takeoff or the landing process, it's different because you will also change the, the motion, the momentum of the complete aircraft on the calculation is more complicated. But it's really outside of the, what we will talk about during this semester because this kind of problem is quite complicated. In order to, to start to understand how to design such kind of engine, we will just focus on the stationary process. And so for us, it will be only about that. On some of the exercises which are on the tutorial worksheet for today are really dedicated to this kind of calculation. Okay? This one is for air. But what happens in vacuum? In vacuum, it's quite different because the, almost the only force which is applying on your vehicle is gravity. And so most of the time, when you want to use your propelling system, your propulsion engine, it's more to change your orbit. So a classical example is when, for example, you want to put a satellite into a specific orbit, so a geosynchronous orbit, so it means your satellite will always have the same position regarding to the Earth all along time, okay? 
And in this situation, you cannot do this into ones because it's too complicated. So the first step is you are using a rocket. This rocket will put your satellite on a lower orbit and it will just fly this way. And at some point, you need to change your orbit. And usually, the, it's not usually, it's, we always use this process because it's a more efficient from the point of view of fuel consumption or propel propellant consumption. You increase your speed in twice, in two steps. First step, you are on a circular orbit, okay? And you just turn on your engine, for example, for 30 to 40 seconds, one minute, it really depends on the spacecraft. And so you increase your speed at this point. And because you don't have any other force applied than gravity, you change your orbit. And if you let things go, you will just follow this ellipse as an orbit, okay? But it's not the one you want. The one you want is the circular one. And so when you reach this point, Again, you turn on your engine, and so you push in order to change your orbit, and the, the word is circularize. You circularize your orbit, so you are changing your orbit from an ellipse to a circular one. And so you just raise the orbit you want, for example, if your satellite is for any kind of telecommunication, telecommunication process. Okay? So this one is two steps. And it's why the design of this engine are completely different from the one of engine in aircraft. For spacecraft or for rockets, um, this engine are working with a really high strength, but for short duration. Uh, for a complete launch, the system is supposed to work for two minutes or something like that. You need to be sure that it will work on nominal situation, on better performance, best performance on during two minutes, okay? Because on uh, usual launch, rocket launch, uh, you need two minutes to, to go into the orbit. If you already take a look at some SpaceX video on YouTube, it's the order of magnitude, it's the typical time you need to reach the lower orbit. For an aircraft system, it's completely different because sometimes you need to fly for 12 to 15 hours. So two minutes, 15 hours. The design is completely different because the constraints which are applied to uh, an aircraft which is supposed to work for 12 hours on another one for two minutes are completely different. Okay? But some physical process and some basic explanation on, uh, are exactly the same. So how it looks like. Uh, this one is a really simplified engine. It's a simplified view of a jet engine, so the one which is used by usual aircraft. How does it work? Uh, hopefully, when you are flying into the air, you have some combustible which is freely available. It's oxygen. Oxygen is everywhere, it's 20% of the atmosphere, even if you, have a, you are at high altitude, and so you can consume it, you can combine it with some fuel in order to produce your combustion process, and this combustion process is used to accelerate, to increase the kinetic energy of the gas, okay? So some air is entering into the engine at a speed which is the one of the aircraft, okay? So in this case, we suppose we are in front of the engine, but just imagine this engine is going this way. And so the speed of the air is the speed of the aircraft, okay? So the air is going in this way. On this side, it's compressed by some compressor, so some uh, rotating compressing system. I will explain later why we use this kind of system. We compress it. We put some fuel here. You, we produced our combustion process. The combustion process is adding some thermal energy into the gas, and this thermal energy is converting into kinetic energy. And at the end, you have a gas which is flowing at a really high speed than the one you are going in. And this is the difference of speed that produced the thrust you want. Okay? So this is really the very basic principle. And in this case, the only liquid you need to have on board is fuel, not combustible. Combustible is free, you just have to consume it outside, okay, in the atmosphere. If you are working with a spacecraft, it's completely different because a significant part of the lifetime of these engines are occurring into space, into vacuum. And so there is no oxygen. And it's impossible to produce any combustion process if you don't have any combustible. In this case, we are carrying on board both combustible and fuel. Okay? And sometimes the difference between combustible and fuel is it's really difficult because sometimes it's the same component which is combined in order to produce the combustion process. This is an example of a rocket engine, which is quite specific because it's a solid propellant rocket engine, which is 
usually called booster. So when you have some launch of rocket, you have a booster, which is usually on the side. Okay, you have, for example, Ariane, or any kind of rocket, and you have this on this side, here on this one of the booster. And it is the first part of the rocket, which is just dropped during the launch. On this one, are called boosters, and they are using solid propellant. Uh, it's really interesting because it's efficient, it's really dense, so you can put, in sort of way, a lot of energy in, in, a, in the same volume. But the bad thing about this kind of engine, is once you trigger it, it's impossible to stop it. Okay? So it's why it's, it's used only for the first step of the launch, for the first stage, because once you are turning this on, it's impossible to stop it until the, the tank is completely empty. And so it burns for maybe one minute or one minute on an half, and after that you just reach the altitude you want, you just drop this kind of booster, so you are going back into the sea. For a few uh, years now, some guys are successing to get them back in order to save some money. It's really good also for ecological purpose, but for a long time we just, we didn't care about this, and it was just going back into the sea. And, uh, it's why it cannot be used for all the use of uh, this kind of engine. It's only for launch, but it's quite specific, and it's a little bit complicated to design because of this. Uh, for, for example, the Ariane rocket, um, this kind of booster are typically manufactured by an um, Italian manufacturer, which is called Avio. Avio is producing the booster of this for the Ariane rocket, if I'm not wrong. Okay. Um, different parts of the uh, rocket are designed or manufactured by different kind of companies, okay? So this one is also working into the vacuum. If I want to go a little bit more into the equation I need in order to make my calculation on to design my engine, the first one is the expression of thrust. There is a, not really complicated, but a complete demonstration of this equation uh, you can find in the reference which is cited, the, this book. All of the book I cite during this lecture, I have them in PDF. So if you just want this file, it's possible for me to produce an archive and to send to you, you will get it back. Maybe it's not a good idea to say this on YouTube, but okay, too late. Um, and so you have a complete demonstration on various uh, different terms uh, that corresponds to different physical phenomena and to different use of this engine. The first one is, this is the momentum, so the force which is create by the rejection of gas, okay? So he mean exhaust, okay? The subscript he is exhaust. So you have some exhaust gas which is rejected at a specific speed which is usually high, okay? The order of magnitude of this speed for this kind of rocket, it's four kilometer per second, okay? 4,000 meter per second. This is the typical speed of the gas at the exhaust of the uh, rocket nozzles. Also, you have the mass flow rate, which is in kilogram per second. This one is the absorbed momentum, which is due to the inlet of the air or of some gas inside the engine. So it's the momentum which is consumed if you have a duct engine, which is, for example, designed this way, and you have some gas which is getting here into, it will transport some momentum because it's a gas with a specific motion, and you have to subtract it when you are considering an aircraft engine. Obviously, if you are dealing with rocket engine, this one doesn't exist because you are not supposed to aspirate any gas. It's only about the propellant, which is rejected. This first part of the momentum, of the, of the thrust, the momentum thrust corresponds to the vast majority of the, of the thrust, okay? It's maybe 80 to 90% of the thrust, which is produced by this. And in some specific situation, on later, we will get back on this to explain why, you also have some pressure thrust. So pressure thrust is produced as long as you have some pressure at the exhaust of the nozzle, which is higher than the ambient one, okay? And so you have, for example, the exit of your rocket here. Um, we will get back on this during the semester, but it's, it's uh, related to some shockwave phenomena. And so you have this kind of structure. I will show you some picture during the next lecture that looks like this, okay? On, on this case, because your flow is really supersonic, you can have a pressure here, which is an exhaust pressure, which is higher than the ambient one. 
And so this difference of pressure, when it's multiplied by the area of the outlet of the engine, will produce some force. So it corresponds to thrust. It's usually, we usually don't want to use this thrust because it's not really efficient, but we don't have the choice for some reason that we'll explain later. And so if you want to decompose or if you want to express and calculate the thrust of a complete engine, we just need to use this relation. Okay? But once you have thrust, it's not enough because we will also, we will later need to establish the link with the amount of fuel which is consumed by the engine. And so, for so, I need to get back to some fundamental uh, concept in thermodynamics, which is work. Okay, so mechanical work. And you already know that mechanical work is basically defined as the product of a force by a displacement, by a distance. Okay, and if you multiply the force in Newton by a distance in meter, you will obtain a for a, an energy, a work, a mechanical work, which is expressed in Joule, okay? But for us, it's not about displacement, it's about the speed, okay? So it's not so complicated, you just have to divide this by an elementary, a small variation of time, and so you will obtain a power, so this one is the rate of work, it's expressed in watt, in kilowatt, you will see that for most of engines, it's in megawatt, because it's a, a huge amount of power. Um, this power is just expressed as the product of the thrust by the relative speed, the speed of the engine, okay? The speed of the vehicle. And so, if you multiply the thrust you need to maintain your motion by the speed at which you are traveling, you will obtain something which is a power, which is expressed in what? And this one is the useful power. It's the one which is required to maintain the motion. If you don't have this, you cannot travel, okay? But sadly, this useful power is not the one you will produce by your engine. You have a sort of efficiency between this, and we will get back on this efficiency. So this one is the final result of your process, of your propulsion process. But in order to do so, you need to, to give some momentum, some rate of change of momentum of the flowing gas. And so, if I just get back to my first engine, and I suppose for the moment I just have an aircraft which is traveling at a specific speed. So this speed, for example, is called the I, and the I is also the speed at which the air is entering into the engine, okay? So the I is also here. Air is entering at a speed the I. So because it's entering at a speed vi, it also transports some kinetic energy. On this kinetic energy, if you want to express it with a dimension of a power, of a rate of energy exchange, it will be note with the mass flow rate, okay, on the speed to the square divided by two. It's just the expression of uh, the kinetic energy, but rate of exchange of kinetic energy, okay? On, because you want to propel your system, you will need to reject some gas at a speed which is higher than this one, which is called VE. The one is the one of the, of the exhaust gas which is getting out of the engine on the amount of kinetic energy which is transported in, into this stream is this. Usually the mass flow rate here is not the same as this one. Why? What is the difference between the mass flow rate of gas at the exhaust and the what at the inlet? At the inlet. No, because it's mass flow rate, so it's not related to geometry. It's just the amount of mass which is transported in and out at any time. Exactly. The fuel is consumed. It's not a lot, but you have some fuel which is initially in the tank, the tank which are usually in wings, and this fuel is getting in here, and so you have mass flow rate of fuel. And the final mass flow rate, which is at the exhaust, is the sum of the one at the inlet, which is air with almost 20% of oxygen, on the one of the fuel. But usually, and we will get back on this calculation later, uh, the amount of fuel is really small against the one of air, and so for most of calculation, we consider we have the same mass flow rate and it works good. Okay, the, the, the error, the calculation error is, is really small. And so from that, 
the actual power you gave to your flow is the difference between the kinetic energy of the exhaust and the kit energy, kinetic energy at the inlet. Okay? Um, you produce this in order to obtain the useful power that corresponds to the motion of the vehicle. Okay? And so the difference between these two power is not only related to the engine, but also to the complete aircraft. Okay? It's a design problem for the complete aircraft. If your aircraft is more efficient, for the same speed, you will be able to decrease your drag because it's really well designed. You use a lot of complicated calculation of fluid mechanics in order to design this, the shape of the, of the vehicle. And so you will decrease the drag and it will be possible to increase, to decrease the difference between the useful power which is used to propel the vehicle and the one which is consumed to accelerate the gas. Okay? And if you are combining this, you obtain what is called the propulsion efficiency. So for an aircraft or a jet engine, this propulsion efficiency is just the ratio of the useful power which is used to propel your vehicle on the one you supply to your stream in order to increase its kinetic energy. Okay? So this one is for the aircraft. I just get this. Okay? Uh, for a rocket, it's a little bit different because we are not aspirating any uh, gas from the inlet, and so the expression is a little bit different. Um, the kinetic energy which is supplied to the gas is expressed this way. This one corresponds to the speed at which the gas is getting out of the uh, rocket. Okay? So it's a conventional definition. These two efficiencies are not really defi defined exactly in the same way because uh, it's um, a performance criterion which is defined in order to be between 0 and 100%, 0% and 100%, and it, this is the reason why these two expressions are slightly different. And now, if I'm getting back to the uh, propulsion efficiency, but for the rocket, once again, it's defined in a slightly different way because we are defining the useful power by the sum of the kinetic and the useful one. Okay? So this one is the one which is supplied to the fuel, to, to the gas stream which is getting in and out of the engine, but it's not the one you are paying for. Okay? The real one you are paying for is the one which is related to the amount of mass which is consumed. And so you have another efficiency which is more, which is only about the engine. For this, it's, it's really only about the engine on the propulsion system. And it, it is related to the ratio of the amount of kinetic energy, kinetic power you will supply to your uh, gas stream over the one which is contained in the, kinetic, in the chemical energy of the fuel. Okay, you have some chemical energy of the fuel, so it's possible to uh, release this in burning the fuel, in mixing it with combustion and in burning it. And uh, not all of this energy will be converted into work. Uh, the first reason is about the second law of thermodynamics, so you already saw that. We, it's impossible to convert, to entirely convert any amount of heat into work. You always have some work which is loose. And the difference between this is related to the Carnot efficiency, so it's exactly the same. And for us, it's exactly the same process. We have some chemical energy which is used when the fuel is burned, and some of this energy is used to increase the kinetic energy of the gas stream, and another one is lost, for example, in heat exchange with the gas or with the engine and so on. Okay? And so at the end, the complete efficiency of the vehicle is just the product of the propulsion efficiency, so the one calculated by the engineers that are working on the, on the aircraft, on, on, the, on the vehicle, on the thermal efficiency, which is the one which is uh, calculated by the engineers that are working on the propulsion system itself. And so if you want to uh, optimize and to make your system really better from a lot of performance point of view, you will need to work both. It's quite obvious, but in this relation, it's really clear. At the same time, on the propulsion efficiency, and so the shape of the vehicle, on the thermal efficiency, and so the performance of the engine. Okay? Clear enough? Not too fast? Would the, like, in, in calculating the thermal efficiency, would something like the consumed chemical power be given? Or? Yes. On, in this case, the, um, the consumed chemical power is usually related to the mass flow rate of fuel, only of fuel, because it is the one you are paying for. 
on the uh, proportion is given by the heating value. Usually the lower heating value. You already heard about this? Heating value. Usually it's lower heating value. So this one is a chemical property of the fuel by itself. And it's expressed in joule per mass, so in joule per kilogram, because it's per mass of fuel. And it's a convention to calculate this only uh, related to the amount of fuel. But I tried <laughs> for a few years to find exactly the same expression, but for rockets. Because in rockets, you are praying for both oxidant and fuel. Okay, for example, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. So you are paying for both. And if I want to obtain exactly the same relation, uh, but which are combining at the same time the, the oxidant, the combustion of the fuel, I didn't find anything related to that. So the only definition I know is the one I usually use on engines. So my only field of expertise is more related to uh, vehicle um, automotive engines, okay, not on spacecraft. And in this case, I didn't find the exact expression. But some expression must be much existing somewhere because we need to pay at the same time for liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Okay? Another performance criterion we will use a lot during this uh, lecture, and maybe you already heard about this, it's called specific impulse. Okay? So the specific impulse is basically the total impulse previously defined, but divided by uh, not exactly the mass flow rate, but the weight, <laughs> weight flow rate of not the fuel, but the propellant you have on board. This one is quite tricky because you have some chemical product on board that can be fuel if it's an aircraft or fuel and combustibility if it's a rocket engine. And this one is important because it's a weight you have to, to carry on with you when you're flying. On this Propellant, these propellant are ejected at a specific rate, okay? And so if you divided the total impulse, so the change of momentum of the complete system, by the change of mass of the complete system, and you just multiply this, it's in order to obtain some, uh, the, the, the criterion in second, you will obtain which is called specific impulse. And this one is really fundamental because it's really related to the efficiency of the engine. If your engine is more efficient, it means you will create a larger thrust for the same amount of propellant which is consumed. Or conversely, for the same thrust, you will consume less propellant, and so you will reject less propellant of your engine. And so it's why, for example, if you are taking a look at some documentation, technical documentation of engines, it's really rare to find the propulsion efficiency. Even if you are looking into Wikipedia, you, will, you won't have a lot of information about propulsion efficiency. But you will have a lot of information, a lot of examples of a specific impulse. This one is really, it is the one, the practical one, which is used in aircraft and spacecraft industry. Okay? So this one is the uh, initial, the complete definition. But once again, we will only consider some stationary process, because if not, it's really too complicated. And it requires a lot of calculations, so some specific software will just stay on really simple situation. And so we suppose we have some stationary operation. And in this case, the average specific impulse, this kind of bracket in this context means average. The average is just the ratio of the thrust which is produced by the mass flow rate times uh, conventional acceleration of gravity, standard acceleration of gravity. It's not the acceleration of gravity for a specific point, it's just an agreement between all the countries in order, to everybody, in order for everyone to do the calculation with the same base. It's when the um, stationary process, it's when the parameters that are used to describe the system are not changing with time. So, for example, pressure, temperature, or even the speed at which you are flying is the same. So when you are at a constant speed, constant altitude, constant pressure, your system is stationary. But if, for example, during a takeoff or a landing, you are changing your altitude, your system is stationary. Because, for example, at one time you will be at, I don't know, 1,000 meters, and maybe 30 seconds after that you will be at 1,000 meters on 500, okay? And so your, your altitude is changing, your, the pressure, everything is changing. And so in this case, if you want to calculate a specific impulse, you will need to integrate over time. 
because parameters are changing. But if you are suppose you are just on a stationary flight, on stationary flight, you have the same thrust, the same speed, the same pressure, everything. And so in this case, it's stationary situation. Yes, but at the same rate. It means, for example, if you have, I don't know, um, 100 kilogram per second, it's 100 kilogram per second at this time and 100 kilogram per second after one hour. Okay? It's changed with time. The, the, the amount of mass is, you have some mass which is continuously lost, but at the same rate. Okay? And so, some example of specific impulse for classical or well-known system. So once again, the higher the specific impulse, the better for um, economical point of view, because you will expend less to pay the fuel for the same duty. And so it's why if you are looking for higher values of the specific impulse, you have clearly you have some typical example of uh, aircraft engine, so the ones that are used, for example, on Airbus or Boeing aircraft, okay? because you need to be efficient in this case. The horizontal coordinate is the Mach number. I will get back on the Mach number of the next session. For the moment, just keep in mind it corresponds to the speed at which, at which you are flying. Okay? And for commercial aircraft, for only economical purpose, um, the optimal Mach number is close to 0 0.8, approximately. Okay? 0 0.7 to 0 0.8. It corresponds, depending on the altitude, to 800 to 900 kilometers per hour, approximately. And this speed is calculated in order to have an optimized economical situation of the complete system. So depending on the price of the ticket and the price of the fuel, basically. And so you have some engines which are really efficient, but which are flying at a moderate speed. Okay? And if you want to increase the speed, uh, sooner or later you will go into some situations which are not related to civil application, but more about military applications. And so you will have some engines that are flying at a really high speed, but with a lower specific impulse because um, the, the efficiency will decrease, okay? Because at this kind of speed, it's not possible to use all the uh, devices which are dedicated to saving some energy. It's not possible to use them, okay? The first example is the engine of the Concorde, which was flying at Mach 2, 2.1 to 2.2. Uh, this engine had an, a specific impulse close to 2,000 seconds, which is really good. It's probably one of the most beautiful engine that has been designed. It's incredible. Now it's not possible for a lot of reasons, including economical reasons, to have some commercial flight at this speed, but back then it was possible. And so you had some, if you are increasing the speed from this uh, range of speed, it's only about military on spacecraft. And so you have some kind of, this one is called the Blackbird. I will be back on this because it's, it's not, um, it's not a, an aircraft, it's a sort of dream or a nightmare depending on which side you are. <laughs> but it's absolutely incredible. On this engine, was, uh, this uh, aircraft was flying at 2.6 to 2.7 Mach number. I have a lot of videos about the Blackbird, so I will just send you the link to the videos and you will take a look at this and you will say, ah, these guys were crazy. Yes, and rich, because it's really, really expensive. After this, it's impossible to have usual engines, so the one with some rotating shaft because it's, it's too high, too high speed on them. The only solution is to use what is called the ramjet. We'll be back on this. Uh, the ramjet is when you are using the inlet speed of the gas in order to increase the pressure with no rotating motion inside, nothing. It's only about this. So you convert the kinetic energy into pressure. You mix with some fuel, you burn it, and the pressure you obtain is again converted into a kinetic energy. It's really difficult to control, it's difficult to design, but it's possible with this kind of engine to, to fly at some speed which are close to Mach 5. So something which is really crazy. Ramjet is when the flow inside the engine is subsonic. Okay, so you are under Mach 1 but inside the engine and you are getting back into supersonic outside. And there is another application which is even more complicated on uh, even, it's really rare to find this because almost none of these engines are, are actually working. It's called scramjet. Scramjet is when even inside your engine you are supersonic. So it's for really crazy on rich guys because it's absolutely, it's, it's really complicated. Anyway, all of these engines are supposed to work with air. So it's aspirating air. And if you are 
looking for a rocket engine, so this one, they don't care about the Mach number or about the altitude because they are working exactly the same into atmosphere or into vacuum. But their specific impulse is really lower, okay? Even for really very good rocket engines, the specific impulse, the order of magnitude, is 400, 300 to 400 seconds, which is really good for this kind of engine, but it's really lower than the one or F of aircraft, and the first reason is we have to carry on board fuel on combustible. Okay, for aircraft it's simpler because it's only about fuel. But for rocket engine, it's fuel on combustible. And so, to produce the same thrust, you will reject more mass at the outside. And so, you, make, you obtain a lower specific impulse. Okay? Okay, we will calculate this during the tutorial, no problem. And once again, so just to finish, it's for the, the very basics you have to keep in mind uh, in order to start the tutorial session, okay? I will need a break because uh, oh, with the mask it's really difficult to brace. <laughs> Do you have any question about that? And I'm whoa, almost on time. <sighs> okay? On the one on YouTube, you can post some question on talk. Maybe I have 100 questions, or maybe it just doesn't work, and they don't have any sound. Or no, I hope it's not. Okay, no answer. So there is nobody, or they are completely sick. Anyway, just to finish this, some reference. Um, if you need it, if you need them, it's just possible to ask. I, I could produce an archive, and we'd get it back. It's a lot of uh, books, so probably you won't have enough time to. But for some specific example or specific explanation, it's, it's really, really good.